The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi everyone, this is Gabby from Waterkeeper Alliance. I just want you all to know that we will be starting momentarily. We're just going to wait for a few more people to join the webinar. So just hold your horses for another three minutes maybe. Hello everyone, welcome to our webinar, Public Relations 101 PR Basics. My name is Gabby, I'm the Training so Associate at Waterkeeper Alliance, and today we have presenters Lindsay Muzio and Ellen Simon from Waterkeeper Alliance. We are so glad that they are here to join us, and we are also so glad that you are all able to join us. Just a reminder that this webinar is being recorded, so for if for any reason you have to leave early or you want to just listen to it again, you'll be able to find it on shelf. I will be sending out the recording and the PowerPoint after this webinar. So we are gonna get started with a quick poll question. So just take a moment to answer this question. Have you ever taken, oh, sorry, this is my typo. Have you ever taken an intro webinar with either Lindsay or Ellen before? We're just gonna wait for a few more people to answer. Okay, and I'm gonna close this up in two seconds. All right, and here are the results. So for Ellen and Lindsay, it looks like not many people have taken a webinar mm -hmm. with you before. All right, Ellen, um, take it away. Great, thank you all so much for joining us today. And I'm so glad that so many of you are new. Um, we've made really extensive slides. We're not going to go into each one in great detail, but please know that they'll be available to you as a resource. Oh. And I'll say this probably at the end, but um, if you have any questions that we don't address today or questions specific to your organization that you'd like to raise privately, please feel free to reach out to either Lindsay or I. 
And I, uh, sorry, this is Gabby. I forgot to mention, if you have any questions, please put them in the question box. We'll be uh, sharing them throughout and we'll also be answering questions at the end. Okay, so here's what we'll be covering. And here is a great quote to just keep in mind as you work on your communications work. Um, David Fenton, who said this, is a great progressive communicator and has worked a lot on environmental issues. We're gonna be talking first about some of the tools in your toolkit for reaching out to the media. The first is talking points. As you think about crafting talking points, it's helpful to think about three main points you want to make, each of which has three supporting facts. So basically three bullet points and then three bullet points supporting each of those. Those talking points should fit on one page of 11 or 12 point type, and each fact that you use should be hyperlinked to a primary source, such as government reports or academic studies. Okay, and next, crafting press releases. Um, as you think about a press release, think about what you can attach to it. Um, again, if you have primary source documents like a lawsuit or lab results that you're comfortable sharing, and obviously discuss lab releasing lab results with your lawyer, photos or maps, videos or infographics, including those will help the help make sure that there's more pickup of your press release. Press, press releases should be short as you think about them. Give them a reason to call you. They should include quotes, but again, the quotes should be short. Um, leave them wanting more. Before you send them out, you should craft um, a spreadsheet of all the media contacts who've covered your issues in the past. And this should be a living document that you keep and keep updated. Okay. Next, you may hear about media advisories, which are different than press releases, in that they tend to be much shorter, and they just state what's happening, where it's happening, time, date, place, contact person. These are good if you have an event that you actually want the press to show up at, or if you're releasing a report that you want um, people in the media to know about. So here's some hints, um, as I say here, Think about how you would tell this story if you were telling it verbally, right? And as I say here, if you saw Shakira at the airport, you wouldn't start by saying that you had to throw your water out at security. You'd start by saying that you saw Shakira at the airport. Um, also be mindful that we speak as environmentalists a very specific lingo. Most people don't know it. So as you write this release, think about how you would explain our issues to your mom or your dad or another relative who might not be well versed in them. Okay, and then the press has its own lingo, which we'll talk about here. This is what it means to talk on the record. Um, next, what it means to talk on background, where your name wouldn't appear in print. And I've given you examples here, the turquoise is hyperlinked, um, off the record, and reasons why you might talk off the record. Next, an exclusive. So if you have a special relationship with a reporter or a media outlet, you, are, you can give them a report or a heads up that something is about to happen first before it is public knowledge and before you send it to other media. If you can get a sense from that reporter, if you have a good enough relationship that you know he or she will run with it, this is a nice way to ensure that something you want to see in the press does, in fact, make it into the press. Okay, here's the press statement. And oops, I may have skipped ahead. Oh, embargo. Um, so this is useful when you have something complicated that you're trying to let reporters get a sense of, such as a detailed report. You can send it to them in advance of when you plan on releasing it with an embargo time that stipulates they can't report it until that time has come and gone. This helps ensure that they'll come to you with questions and sometimes because it's embargoed, they won't be able to come to your opponents. So it's helpful in getting the word out if you have a study, 
if you plan on um, filing a suit, if you're doing something where you want to give reporters a lead time to digest and to plan for what you're about to do. Okay, next is a press statement. These are really helpful, again, when you have a complicated issue or if you're doing something that you anticipate there will be a lot of press interest in. Here's an example of a press statement that we've sent out, um, and the hyperlink is on the left-hand corner. So as you talk to the press, you can ask up front in these conversations if they'll give you a read back, which means they'll read back either your quote or the quote from the spokesperson or quoted person from your organization. Some news organizations won't let this happen, but again, if you're talking about something really complex, it's worth asking if it's a possibility. Okay, op-eds, this is just defining what an op-ed is. Um, these originally got their name because they appeared opposite the opinion page in originally the New York Times. So that's how, that's how they got their name. Separately, there's an editorial, which is written by the staff at the paper itself. And as I say here, you can and should ask to meet with the editorial board of your local paper if they have one, um, especially when there's legislation or litigation that your organization is part of. Um, and as I say here, when you do that, prep yourself and come with talking points. Letters to the editor, I love these. These are really a way for small groups to punch above weight. Um, it, it costs you nothing to try to get your letter to the editor into the paper. Think about them as really short ways to make your argument. And if you can have more than one of your supporters write one, it really gives the appearance that you have a real groundswell of support. Okay. Other lingo to know as you talk to the press, time element, um, timing your comps to something that you expect to be in the news, which increases their chances that it will be picked up. A news hook is if there's been something else that links to what you have to say in the news. Um, and my example is, what will hosting the Super Bowl mean to Miami's failing sewer infrastructure? And that would be from an organization like Miami Waterkeeper that really doesn't want to miss an opportunity to talk about that failing sewer infrastructure. So it's, it's a gimmick, but gimmicks are good. Okay, here's some more tips and hints, which I'll let you read rather than reading them aloud to you. So before we go on, does anybody have any questions about those two sections? And this is just a reminder that you can either fill out questions in the question box or you can raise your hand and I can unmute you. So far, I'm seeing no questions, Ellen. Okay, hearing none, we'll move on. Here's some key principles of media relations. Gravity is your friend. Um, and I've included quotes. This is Primo Levi describing how he survived Auschwitz in one sentence. Toni Morrison describing how racism functions in two sentences. Representative Barbara Jordan outlining her approach to the Watergate hearings in one really beautiful cogent sentence. Again, as you think about putting a quote together for a press release, remember how short the Gettysburg Address was. As you communicate to the press, it is okay, and in fact, it's great if you find yourself saying the same thing again and again. And the same really goes for your social media too, I think, and Lindsay, Lindsay may differ, which I'd love to hear, but um, driving a message home is one way to make sure that people hear it and make sure that they're associating that same message with you. No, it's a great example. Oh, go ahead. I was going to say, I agree. In terms of social media, it's all very similar in communicating to the public and to your audience. Just brevity, you know, simple, plain language and message repetition will get your point across. Thank you. Um, I love this song from Lucinda Williams as an example of message repetition. You really get a sense of where she stands with this other person in the song. I love this quote also from E.B. White, make every word tell. So as you look over a press release, 
a statement, anything you're sending out, go through it if you have the time. And White used to say, omit needless words. And then he'd say it again, omit needless words, omit needless words, because he loved rep message repetition too. So look it over and omit those needless words that aren't telling your story. I wanted to give you also a real quick overview of the press. My data in here is largely from UNC Chapel Hill, the Knight Foundation, and American Journalism Review. I'm not going to go into this in huge detail, but I just wanted to do it as a quick overview. So there have been 1,800 local paper closures since 2004, um, job cuts of 26,300 journalists. And back in 2008, when I was still a reporter, roughly 40 newspaper men and women were laid off every day. This, um, and I, as part of the, the slide presentation, I'll give you a link to this if you'd like to um, zoom in on where you live. But this is a map of news deserts where there's, these are counties where there's only one newspaper or where there's none. Television news has hired up a little bit over the last decade. However, the total number of TV journalists is half the number of newspaper journalists that were employed in 2008, so they can't pick up all the slack. Local websites, news websites, have filled the void a little, but only a quarter of these, a quarter of these are nonprofit. Um, two thirds were in the country's seven largest metro areas. So they're not everywhere, and only one in five attracted enough visitors and funding to be self-sufficient. So in my opinion, these will never fill the void of local newspapers. What does this mean to you? Um, if it seems harder to place a story than it was in the past, it really, it's because it is. Um, when you approach a reporter, have as much information as possible at your fingertips because the reporters who still have jobs are often really overloaded and a lot of them are, are quite young. Think visually, which is helpful um, for how news is presented now. A little bit about the life of a reporter, no job security, pay is terrible. On the other hand, everybody hates you. <laughs> uh, so I tell you this because um, oh, and here's the pay, which which may not seem terrible everywhere, but if you're making forty thousand dollars in one of the most expensive metro areas in the country, it's going to be tough. And then the lowest ten percent are earning twenty two thousand, which factor in that they're young and have student loans. It's just going to be miserable. Um, again, oops. What does this mean for you? Again, um, a little bit more here. Don't wait to be asked for background information and don't assume a reporter will have time to take it over the phone. As you prepare to talk to a reporter, write what we call a backgrounder on the topic that you'll be talking about. Again, it, it might just be a different form of your talking points, an external form with hyperlinks to those primary sources, as well as any relevant um, court files, academic papers, videos, et cetera. Who does this? Why would anyone do this? Um, here's a sense of who does this. At Associated Press, where I used to work, we used to joke, you can't spell cheap without AP. Most journalists don't like to talk about this, but I do want to talk about it a little today. This is a field that you have to be able to afford to enter. So when you are talking to reporters about challenges that primarily affect people who are impoverished, Remember that most reporters are people who are broke, but they've never been poor. Um, so it's just important to remember that and try to set the table for what some of the environmental challenges we face might mean in, in environmental justice terms, um, especially to a person who has never been poor. So here's some thoughts on, on how to approach reporters and again this is a relationship business so anything any kind of bio biographical information you can give about yourself or the spokesperson or leadership of your organization that humanizes them 
is really effective in a relationship business, especially a relationship business with a lot of turnover, which this one is. I'm gonna go really quickly through the demographics of the press. This is um, a photo, it's not a good reproduction, sorry, of photographers covering Mark Zuckerberg when he testified before Congress. As you can see, this group is almost 100% white and mostly male. This is a newsroom gender breakdown. Um, and I'll just, wait, let me just find the source for y'all. Um, this is from Google Trends, done with the American Society of Newspaper Editors. In the center here, the 50-50 split would be half men and half women. To the left is where newsrooms, most newsrooms fall, almost all newsrooms, which is that there are more men than women, um, with the average being 63% male to female. The next slide is um, white and non-white breakdown versus the audience. The center line is what a newsroom would look like if its racial composition was the same, was on parity with the city that it's covering. And again, most newsrooms on average, they're 25% overrepresented by white people. So again, as you, um, as you present environmental justice issues, you may be talking to a reporter who is clueless, for lack of a better word, or, or is trying to be sympathetic but doesn't have firsthand experience. The same goes for, for TV and radio. Um, and then I have a sense here of what, what this means for you. With my last bullet point as a former journalist, when you talk to a woman reporter, be kind to her because she's put up with a lot. Okay. And now Lindsay's going to address external communications and planning. Okay, does anybody have any questions for Ellen on that section before we get moving? I don't see any, so. Okay. So if you want to go to the next slide, Ellen. Oh, sure. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so creating a comms calendar is really great when talking about releasing press releases, you know, media. Um, alerts, things like that. It is good to plan. Planning is your friend. Think about your upcoming events, what communications you might be planning to do around them. We find it really helpful to create a calendar where we can list out, you know, any blog posts, email blasts, plan social media posts, press releases, where we're going to be putting those, um, and when, just so we can have a visual idea of how our calendar is going to go out for the next few months. Um, we do that in a few different ways. We use Google Calendar, so we have our internal communications and our external communications on Google Calendar. Um, we have a social media editorial calendar that I have in Google Sheets, um, and I've discussed a bit about that in a previous social media 101 webinar. Um, so just keeping things organized and knowing how you're going to um, get this information out there. Um, and then kind of how all that information can go across platforms. Um, for example, with social media, um, or if you send out a press release, you'll probably also want to post that press release on your website if you are able to do that. Um, so you have something to link to, and then you can also post that on social media to direct people back to the full press release and get that information out there. Um, so all of these things can kind of, the information and content can be used in different, um, different types of media. And then, um, great, thank you, Ellen. Oh yes, you could go to the next slide. Um, in terms of sharing your information on social media um, and getting this information out there, um, we have a few tips here that kind of link to other resources that we've created. We recently, Ellen and I did a taking on the trolls webinar and that was kind of about if you are discussing kind of a contentious issue or maybe an issue that has two different very passionate sides of um, views and if people decide to attack your social media page um, with negative reviews or commenting a lot of um, misinformation or negative information, we discuss in that webinar how to handle that, what steps to take. Um, one of those, one of our advice is just if you are releasing information that is um, that might bring negative attention, uh, maybe keep that to your website page or to emails as opposed to starting 
um, maybe a contentious conversation on social media. Um, but then you can also craft a commenting policy in case, you know, just basically it's a message that says this is what we expect people, how we expect people to act on our social media pages, kind, respectful, accurate information. If they don't follow those rules, we can hide those comments or take a number of actions. Um, and so we've linked here, which will be shared in the webinar after the fact, our posting policy, some other sample posting policies. Um, good resources kind of on evaluating when you want to respond to things like that. Um, and then talking about our troll patrol, which is how Waterkeeper Alliance can help you if you do want to get more positive attention on your social media pages. Um, but overall, when sharing press releases or anything of that sort, um, I think it's always good to share on social media. Um, press releases are great because they usually come with really excellent quotes. So that's a really easy way to share, you know, just the quote on Facebook um, or something or on Twitter. You can share a shortened version of the quote and people usually give really good responses to those. Um, in terms of pushing all of this out, it really depends. I've done a lot of social media webinars in the past, so we have a lot of great resources on the Waterkeeper Resource Library, and that discusses kind of timing of how many posts you should be doing, timings of posts, um, and it really does kind of vary organization to organization, so there's a lot of different ways of thinking about that. Um, and yeah, I definitely go into more depth on the shelf account. So if anybody has specific questions related to social media, um, I would love to go over those now if you have any. Um, but yeah, I think the main takeaways from this is just planning everything out, knowing when to expect a press release so that you can also plan to get it up on your website, get it out on your social media pages, um, and really get it out there to the public. And I just say, if you find your organization bedeviled by trolls, please reach out to Lindsay or I, and we can give you custom advice for your organization and also um, activate the troll patrol, which can bury negative comments with positive comments. Great. Thank you, Ellen and Lindsay. Um, I'll give everyone a moment to maybe think of some questions if you have any. Uh, as a reminder, Ellen. Has provided her email if you think of questions later you can let her know or uh, or you can raise your hand and I'll unmute you and um, yeah and I would just add that yeah always feel free to reach out to us I'm happy to help anybody with social media questions or getting things set up on their website or their social media pages um, we're definitely here to help you and we are always happy to um, hear about whatever you're working on and get to work with you on that Oh, I see a question here. Hold on one second. Oh, I, someone, uh, Stephen Pul Pulliam is saying thank you all. <laughs> thank you. So, actually, Ellen, I have a question for you. Yes. Um, you're, you say that uh, a lot of press are may, maybe don't really understand environmental justice. So do you have any tips on the best way to approach a reporter with an environmental justice issue? Well, that's a really good question. I think um, sometimes data is a really great way in uh, because it helps you prove that something's unfair. It doesn't always exist, obviously, but when you do have data, it can be a very powerful tool. For instance, there's a public health study in North Carolina that shows that even when you adjust for income, people who live near concentrated animal feeding operations have worse health. And this study included emergency room visits, low birth rate, infants, hypertension, all cause mortality. And it's something that's really hard to argue with. So when you have any kind of data that bolsters your argument, it's really worth including especially um, when you're saying that something isn't fair. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Uh, so we have a question from Lola. What's the best way to share a backgrounder? Oh, that's a really good question, Lola. So if you have a backgrounder on a specific issue, I think this is gonna really depend on the context, 
but um, let's say you're going to file a lawsuit and it's coming down the pike or there's a contentious issue in your watershed, you can just send that to press that you know. Um, yeah, so I think I think that's that's a good way to do it. Also, honestly, you can use it when as kind of an outline when you talk on the phone with somebody if you do, and then send them the actual document itself after the fact. Okay, thank you, Ellen. I just wanted to add one thought. As you think about building media relationships in your watershed, some of the things that you do as a matter of course, such as boat rides or plane overflights, are wonderful things to invite press along with you on. So um, as you schedule boat rides or, or cleanups or any action, these are wonderful things to invite um, reporters to or editors to and good ways to cement those relationships. And it doesn't have to be that you're asking them to write a story. You can just um, take them on a ride along to explain what the issues are in the watershed. Okay, Ellen, thank you. Um, I don't see any more questions and nobody's raising their hand. So um, I think we can end this webinar. And as a reminder uh, that it was recorded, so you'll be able to listen again, or um, you, I'm also going to be sending out the PowerPoint so you can look that over. And I just wanna thank the presenters again, Ellen and Lindsay. And I also want to thank all of the attendees for joining us. And um, I hope everyone has a great rest of their week. Thanks, Gabby. Thank you, Gabby.